Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for being here on a Sunday afternoon. I am very excited to be in conversation with the fabulous Janice and on this incredible book, which I hope many of you have picked up and certainly some of you have also read before this session. I want to start off our session today, Janice, by just reading a little bit about the praise that this book has received and its high praise. Amitabh Ghosh says it's a novel like none other. It's gotten praise that also compares it to a emotionally resonant as Kiran Desai's The Inheritance of Loss, as inspired as Anthony Doerr's Cloud Cuckoo Land, as inventive as Louisa Hall's Speak, and as visionary as David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas. So, you know, you've really got a stellar constellation to work within. And to me, it's been a novel that's wayward, it's delicate, it's tracing the quietly poetic language of the natural world. Tell us about how this novel came about and what inspired you to write it. You know, to a question like, like this, I never know where to begin because I feel like all the books that we write take all our lives to write, that they somehow are uh, part of a trajectory of all of the experiences that we've had, um, all the gardens we've visited, all the walks we've taken, the people that we've, con we've had conversations with, the people we've loved. Um, and so it's very difficult, I think, to pick a particular temporal point to say, ah, this is where the book mm -hmm. begins um, in my head, in my life. Um, but I suppose to make things a little easier and to respond in a way that's more meaningful um, to you, um, I think it would be in a garden, quite fittingly. And I love, by the way, that it feels like we're all in a garden Right now, it's just the most lovely venue. Um, in a garden, maybe a decade ago, um, somewhere outside London, I think it was Salisbury, I'm not sure, and there happened to be this tiny little exhibition in the corner somewhere of women botanists from the Victorian and Edwardian um, ages. and. They stayed with me. They were wild and unruly, and they led lives that really they weren't meant to be living at that time. And somewhere, uh, a character formed um, somewhere in my head, Evelyn, um, who we meet in Everything the Light Touches. And I could see her journeying from London to India sometime in the early 1900s. Um, she was perhaps even journeying to a place closer to where I call home. And um, I asked myself, what is she looking for? She's a botanist. Um, she's a woman. She's, you know, feisty and adventurous. And what is she looking for? And I think I, think I had to write the book to find that out. And that's, that's, that takes me to a very present sort of narrative within the book, which are these two contradictory urges, right? You have four narratives that stretch across the book. And at the same time, you have an urgency of travel. All your characters are traveling. They're going somewhere else. There's this feverish urge to move away, to discover, to explore. And then they're met with a quaint, quiet solitude, the language of plants. They're met with an atemporality that requires you not to rush in, as they all have, but to sit quietly. And what were these two sort of urges that, that form such an important rhythm within the book? And you're a poet, and this venue has always seen poetry at JLF before, so it's only fitting that we discuss it here. What is the rhythm that moved through the book? And where were these urges coming in as you wrote? I love that you um, place the central tussle uh, within the book as a, as a tussle of movement and stillness because that's in some ways exactly what it is. Um, at the heart of the book is a tussle between two ways of seeing. Um, one that calls for fixity, for stillness, for calcification in some ways for um, a knowing that um, perhaps is, 
is focused on categories and labels and boxes and names, taxonomy. And the other movement is one of fluidity and freedom and being unbound and having no tethers and, and being unanchored. Um, and these two ways of seeing are what clash and, and, um, and meet uh, within the book in all sorts of ways. Um, through the travelers, of course, which is why travel performs such an important vehicular um, 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 uh, you know, function in the book. It, it, it behaves as uh, a way for us, the readers, and for me to explore movement, quite literally. What does movement throw up? Th movement travel throws up newness unfamiliarity. Uh, it throws up shifts in perspective, shifts in our inner landscapes and movement and travel always, even though we're journeying outside, make us journey inside as well. It's throwing up unfamiliarity so that we may know how do we deal with this unfamiliarity? How do we deal with these shifts in perspective, right? So even within travel, there's this um, wonderful duality, right? Um, and of course, within the stillness, within the fixity, um, comes a quietude, I think, that perhaps was magnified by the fact that I was writing this book in the middle of lockdown. And it's just become lockdown now because I don't know how many there were by the end of it. There were so many. Um, and I think I found that kind of stillness. I was very blessed and very privileged to have a space that could shelter me from, from the storm, so to speak. Um, and within that space, there was this kind of quietude, perhaps, that none of us had ever experienced before a kind of stillness that we hadn't experienced before, a way of being that really suddenly centered us into ourselves and perhaps made us ask all of these questions about where we want to be and where we wish to anchor ourselves and who we wish to be with and what do we really want to do with this one wild and precious life that we have. So these are, you're so right, the two impulses that move very, very strongly through the book and they generate, I hope, all of this energy, all of these adventurous stories and situations that uh, the travelers encounter, but I hope in some way that we do as well as readers. You know, Janice, you, you talk about movement as a site of both rupture, but also as a site of this sort of meditation. You've moved a lot between Meghalaya and Delhi. The one part of your bio that has not been read out today is that you share a home with a cat of many names. Tell us about this cat and their many names. Oh, my cat puts everything into perspective because he doesn't care about anything. All of this, all the fuss and fury, the pandemic, um, you know, literary prizes, literary sessions, literary festivals. Oh my God, all he wants is his little spot in the sun. And where the light touches. Where the light touches. And he's perfectly happy if he's allowed out of the door in the morning and he follows the sun through the day. Um, and he does have many names because as a cat, he is whimsical and willful and stubborn and will only respond to you if he feels like it. So he's called Vincent on most days. <clears throat> Papu, to acknowledge his North Indian roots. Um, but also Kitty, because he is just beautifully generic like that. <laughs> But you know, Janice, this is, this is something that struck me. There's a certain whimsicality to the cat of many names. The cat of many names has occupied your bio for many, many years now. But this multiplicity of names is something that seeps into the writing. When I read this book, I was reminded of Aga Shahid Ali's poem, Kashmir, 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 right? And it's about this idea of 
varied names carrying multiple meanings and varied histories. That sort of is such a central preoccupation of this book, right? The fixing of categories, the changing of names, the idea of something having a static identity. So tell us a little more about how that gets ruptured yeah. in this whimsicality of nomenclature. Well, I think uh, in some ways, Kitty or Vincent or, or Papu, whichever name he wishes to respond to today, um, teaches us a very important lesson that perhaps we can't really ever name anything, that the thing itself has to tell us what its name is and that we have to be patient and quiet enough and listen carefully enough in order to be able to hear the name that is being shared with us. There's a wonderful book by Robin Kimmerer, who is this incredible scientist and a poet and also a member of a First Nations um, indigenous community um, in America. And she writes um, in, in this wonderful book called Gathering Moss, she writes, what do the moss wish to be called? What are their names? What, what do they wish um, to be um, acknowledged as? And I think, you know, as whimsical, as perhaps new agey as that might sound, I think it teaches us a really important lesson in how to be truly humble. Uh -huh. We are not here to own and name and say that this is mine. You know, we are here to say, what may I learn from being on this planet, from looking at a tree, from petting a cat, from being in a garden, from wandering around, having conversations? What may I learn? Um, I think within that, there is a very important hierarchy that's completely dislodged. Because we come from a tradition of science, of, 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 of other disciplines that tend to impose upon the world a kind of order that, that we think, and possibly certain parts of the world, the Western Eurocentric world, think that we have a right to impose upon the world, right? We have a, um, we are entitled uh, to impose a natural order, including taxonomically, to name things, because we are in some way placed hierarchically above all of nature, that we are the darlings of creation, that we sit atop this fabricated entirely, this pyramid of who is important in this world. Right? And we sit right at the top of that. And so we name things and we give order. We bestow order upon the world. Um, and I think it's a deeply sort of um, um, enlightenment-driven um, you know, uh, impulse. But um, to say, let me, let me stand back. Let me dismantle this pyramid. Let me listen. Let me ask a question and begin a dialogue with the world. Let me be in conversation. Mm -hmm. Let me see what I may learn. Um, I think that's, that's far more meaningful. That's far more perhaps um, helpful for us as a species as well to learn. And I think this is important, right? And in the book, Evelyn's Journey mm -hmm. is running away from sexism and botany and within the sort of corridors of academia, and of the sexism present within. And the political implications of this book, I think, become far more evident when she comes and realizes that the violence is not just in the ways in which academia perpetuates sexism, but in the very way in which the field exists, right? What is the violence of naming? What is the violence of creating fixed categories, right? Um, and you know, I'd done a show recently where I showed Garima Gupta's work. She's a fabulous artist who creates these light boxes about minerals and the sort of invisible histories of the sort of minerals that exist in natural history museums across the Western world, which sort of hide the history of mining, that hide the letters written by people back home, by, including by those who were sent there to mine from the West. And in many ways, I think the book asks us to think deeper 
about what does it mean to create these categories and set them in stone and the violence that follows through it. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, the reason why this... I know that there's um, a lot of lyricism and, 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 and beauty and, 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 and poeticism that, that people take great comfort from um, while reading this book, but it is, quite honestly, uh, the most deeply political book that I've ever written. Um, and it is precisely because of this, it is trying at its very heart to dismantle or to question categories. Everything in the world that we fight against, everything that we try and resist, is attempting to do just that, to put us into boxes. Nationalism, caste, gender, sexuality, class, they're trying to reduce us, to diminish us into this singular narrative, into this one thing. And this book is questioning that, the very foundations upon which all of these um, isms are built, you know? Um, and so it, it, it's trying to disrupt at a very, very foundational level. And thank you so much. Uh, for bringing that up and for picking up on that. No, thank you so much because I think we've had a lot of sessions this JLF. We had your wonderful session with Merlin and Fungi. We've sort of spoken about the natural world so profoundly. And I think there has been a sort of characterization of innocence that is really important to sort of bring out. But here you see the sort of insidious nature of that innocence, right? You see the violence that sort of traverses the same path that that innocence travels upon. I want to shift gears very quickly because I'm also aware of the time. And I want to turn to the form of this book. The first time I read this book and the first time I met Janice at JLF this year, I said, you must be absolutely mad. She's crazy. Which is She's written a book true. that nobody can edit. I saw her editor today and said, I pity you. Because it's prose poetry, prose poetry, lyricism, and fiction, and nonfiction, and history, everything, everywhere, all at once. What were you thinking, Janice? <laughs> what? I have no idea. <laughs> but one must be mad, no? Uh, uh, one evidently. <laughs> one must be a little crazy and a little obsessed and a little sort of, oh my God, what I'm, am I doing? But I must do this anyway because there is something here and there is something that this that this book is trying to do. And to be very honest, um, this is also one of my books that I feel was not quite written by me. It comes from elsewhere. It comes from the earth. It comes from the cosmic. It comes from my ancestors. It comes from everything, everywhere, all at once. And it feels like it has been told through me, but not by me. That it's such an it's it's such an epic work of collaboration. That's what it is. Like your acknowledgement section, which <laughs> runs on and on. Um, <laughs> so I want to I want to take some time to also get Janice to read because she reads so beautifully. The central section of this book is the chapter on Linnaeus, who is the only character to have only one chapter but he gets the chapter at the center of the book because it's structured like a palindrome. So the four characters, each of them get two chapters, and in the middle of them sits Linnaeus. And Linnaeus's section is poetry, prose poetry, disrupting everything, everywhere, all at once, and concrete poetry. But the one poem I want you to read is this lovely one that really brings out everything that the light touches and what the light touches that we don't know too much about. So, Janice. I'd be delighted. Um, so just a little context. Um, all of these poems are written as part of a larger lyric narrative, a lyric travel narrative that's told by Linnaeus, our 
Swedish botanist who is very earnest and very serious about the job that he's doing. He's 25 years old and he's setting out on his first and probably last solo adventure. Um, he wasn't quite the avid sort of traveler um, as the others are. Um, some of these poems though, while Linnaeus is writing to the land, to the people, imposing all sorts of taxonomical order on what he sees, there are some poems, very few, but they're there, that speak back. And these are the indigenous peoples on that land. These are poems that the earth writes back to Linnaeus. And this is one of them. And it's called Brunisburgit. It's the place of it, it's the name of a place. For Linnaeus, as you approach Brunisburgit, turn left, find a cave formed by nature in the mountain, resembling a dwelling made all out of stone. The front is open, narrower, lower than within, which is so lofty you cannot reach the roof. The entrance is concealed, guarded on the outside by two large trees, a fir and a birch, while the descent lies hard and steep. On the floor you find rocks, burnt stumps, and the neighboring people inform you that for two years a man, sage or criminal, concealed himself in this cavern. You linger a while for moss on stone, for fungus textured like sponge, and something else entirely undiscoverable. Everywhere, near the road, glittering in the sun, lies spa full of talc or fine Muscovy glass. Stones are piled on stones. Are you outside? or in, you cannot be certain. Not everything the light touches can be seen. I'm gonna let us just sit with that for a second, Janice, because, you know, that's, I think that's where the book really shines. I think it's in these moments of quiet reflection, of solitude, of, as you said, the poem speaking back of this narrative sort of weaving in. And a lot of reviews have said, you know, we don't know how these things fit together. And I think this is where they fit together. This is where the sort of book speaks back in some ways and holds a quiet sort of tenuous link that moves around. I want to turn a little also to the fact that across the book, we hear of what the plants are teaching us. We hear of how to learn from plants. And I want you to, again, because we already started off reading, I want you to continue reading. And this time, from a prose section, and if I can find it. There we go. On Moritz and Goethe. I'd love to. This is Goethe in Rome in 1886, sorry, was it 1786? <laughs> yes, time. <laughs> we'll I get mean. to that also in a bit about the time. Absolutely, <laughs> I will have perfectly eloquent things to say by then about time. <laughs> I just keep getting dates mixed up. Um, but this is Goethe in Rome, in a place unlike any other that he's ever seen and it's been his lifelong wish to be there for many reasons. Um, but for many reasons, this journey is very important to the book. Um, Goethe's flight to Italy, as he calls it, because um, it is a dream fulfilled. But it's important to the book because it's also the place where he witnesses a kind of uh, lushness and greenness that he has never witnessed in his more, shall we say, northerly homeland. <laughs> Right? And he's here and he's having conversations with friends. Ah. And, <laughs> um, and he's in a garden, much like we are, and they're talking. And this is what he says. 
Um, should I start from this I bit? I think from, yeah. Okay. He's holding a bay leaf um, in his hand. Goethe points at it. How does this smell to you? Moritz sniffs it again, oddly enough, of my mother's tomato sauce. To me, says Goethe, a stuffy university hall filled with graduates wearing laurel wreaths. He smiles, his eyes shining. We have rich facilities with which to absorb the world, the gift of our eyes and noses and ears. And yet, and yet, often we sacrifice all of these at the altar of our so-called intellectual mind. He taps his forehead. Then he steps closer to the laurel tree. The leaves press into his shoulders, his chest. I think, I think one way to overcome object thinking is to approach a living thing as the subject that it is. This calls for careful looking and thinking with the mind's eye, Moritz, on Schwang, and then asking one and only one question of any importance, which is, what do you have to teach me? The laurel towers over his head, its leaves waving in the breeze. Do you see why, Moritz? His friend hesitates. Because this invites dialogue? Yes, says Goethe, pleased. A way by which we strive to stay close to what is being studied, to learn what the plant has to tell us, rather than to impose on it what we already believe. Moritz leans closer to the bush. How, how does one do this? In Goethe's voice, a tremor of excitement. If we wish to behold nature in a living way, we must follow her example and make ourselves as mobile and flexible as nature herself. With this, he detaches himself from the laurel and makes to walk away. Moritz follows. We must aspire, my friend, Goethe continues, to think like a plant. By this, he does not he does not mean they need to learn how to purify air using the action of the sun. He laughs, pleased with his own joke. Rather, we learn from plants a way of living thinking. With my gentian, it struck me how even in its apparent stillness, it was a dynamically sensitive being, forming and changing itself through dialogue with what Ever conditions it met in the world. Air, moisture, light. They clatter down the monumental stairs and take the path that leads to the wooded slopes of Monte Mario. To be inspired by plants, Moritz, is to learn to drop fixed ideas, to enter into an open-ended dialogue with the world. Goethe gazes up at the canopy, raising his arms in a gesture of embrace. And maybe then, maybe then, all will be revealed. Thank you. Thank you so, so much again, Janice. And I feel, I feel very glad to be on stage with you today because I feel that I'm indulging myself in having you read out and doing myself a great favor by asking whatever I want to on this stage. I'm going to ask you one last question because I know we also have a lovely audience that's eager to ask you questions. You know, this book is part of an emerging set of narratives that are preoccupied with not just an attitude towards nature as one of wonder and awe. And yesterday, Ranjit Hoskade was speaking about ice light. And he spoke about what does it mean not only to talk off nature like the romantics, but rather to think through nature. And there's a beautiful essay by Nikita Azad in Aeon, which talks about moss 
And was it, what does it mean to sort of touch and feel and think through moss? And your book, again, both through its political project and through the waywardness, as Saidiya Hartman would call it, manages to sort of traverse along an uncertain path, asks us, like your passage just described, to think through plants, not off plants. Do you think you're in a moment? It certainly feels like it, even though everything is unplanned and everything is unmanipulated. Um, it took me 10 years to work on this book and it cannot in, in some ways be any kind of preemption, at least for me, that far in advance. But I do feel that because I was perhaps in a space where these conversations were just beginning to emerge. I was in London, I was studying. Um, I was surrounded by friends who were at places like the Schumacher College in Totnes, uh, which actually offer um, courses on um, Gertian science. Um, so I think I was at a place with certain people where these conversations were just beginning to emerge. And this question, which I think reached a kind of crescendo during the pandemic, the question of what is our relationship to our planet, to our Earth, were just beginning to, to be murmured out into you know, the public, out into spaces um, like these. Um, and of course, there is also this incredible, inexplicable alignment, things that you you can't explain what is it about this moment. I think that actually it's not about this moment at all um, because we often tend to think of the ecological crisis, climate change as a thing, as an issue of here and now, but it isn't really. It began so long ago, so many centuries past, and I think perhaps to speak of being in a moment actually sends me looking back rather than just forward or just here. It makes me wonder where can we actually travel to to understand what this moment is. It's what I hope the book um, does as well, um, offer this long perspective, this sense that things are always in some kind of continuum that there is continui continuity always, that Linnaeus's story is linked to Shai's story um, and to the anti-uranium movement, even though they seem to sit on literally separate parts of the planet and in separate um, temporal um, spaces, right? So this is a moment, but I, I think that it's also a very long moment, that it, it had always been there somehow and 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 we need to understand how we grasp and hold this moment but also let it go into a future in in a meaningful um in a meaningful way you know i love the temporality of that and this idea of motion and this idea of the past meeting the present fact bleeding into fiction memory crossing the line into sort of imagination. And I want you to read one last bit, which is my final vignette from the book, from Evelyn's chapter, which I think, after I've met you, reminds me a little of you um, on her grandmother. And after that, please keep your questions ready. We'll have 10 minutes for questions. Is it a dream or a memory of walking through a forest with Grandma Grace she was nine and something caught her attention. A beetle, a colorful toadstool, and when she straightened up, she was alone. She wasn't immediately frightened. She was certain Grandma Grace would be ahead, tall, handsome, smiling, with her hat and scarf and basket, the sun behind her, lighting her up like a painting. Evie walked on, but Grandma Grace was gone. She stumbled forward, calling out, but the woods were silent around her, undisturbed except for the thud of her small footsteps and her heart. 
Soon it was a path no longer, but rough undergrowth, the trees growing taller and closer. She was crying, but not too loudly in case someone other than her grandmother would hear her, wolves or bears or other monsters. When she started slowing down, exhausted, she suddenly came to a stream. And on the other side, standing as though she had always been waiting, was Grandma Grace. Come, she called across the water, gesturing to her granddaughter. And Evie stood on a stone on the opposite bank and hesitated. Don't be afraid, darling, she said, her arms open and waiting as Evie leaped across. But this is when she wakes, or the memory ends. Does she make it? Does she not? She doesn't remember. She doesn't know. Thank you so, so much again, Janice. What a lovely, delightful time. And I'm very excited now for the questions to come. So, Anyone in the audience who has questions after this powerful, powerful, the lovely lady right in the center. Uh, uh, can you raise your hand again and you will be able to see her. Thank you so much. Thank you for this lovely conversation. I'm definitely picking this book up after this. Um, the question I had was in the, in the beginning of the entire conversation, you had said how your entire life is um, informing the book and has yes. led to this book at the end of it all. Yeah. And at your introduction, someone had also mentioned that you're also a teacher at Ash Ashoka University. Um, I would want to extend that because, um, and, and the question is, how has your life informed your role as a teacher? Mm -hmm. And I know that, um, what they say, everything that you've talked about are about very finer aspects and it's difficult to uh, induct somebody into it and move them through the process of figuring what it means for them on their own and I think that's what teachers do at the end of it all. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Right. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I think I would prefer to use the word guide rather than teacher. I'm slightly uncomfortable with that word because again it sets up that hierarchy that we've been talking about that we're trying so hard to dismantle and disrupt as though I have something to teach and I will bestow my wisdom upon you in some sort of, you know, uh, way. Um, I think the space within my classroom or our classroom and the space outside that need to exist again in this kind of continuum. Um, so we discuss and we, we, we deal with writing within the classroom space, within my classroom space. But I, I, I often and repeatedly um, suggest to my students that they bring their lives into that space, their storytelling lives, the lives that they carry from outside that into this space because there is no stopping our storytelling lives outside that space and within that space, right? That there is a continuum, that we carry stories with us and some of them make it into books and some of them don't, but we carry stories with us as soon as we're born and perhaps even before. Um, and so I, wa I, I would love for my students to acknowledge that, that continuity. Right, that their lives and their stories that they carry from where they've come, from who they are, from who their families might be, their communities, their larger neighborhoods, all of that forms part of our writing life. Um, and I think the other thing that I hold really close to my heart um, in this space is that I am there to learn. And I am actually the one who is learning much more because there are so many um, to learn from. And I think perhaps a good teacher is somebody who is a good student. Um, and, and that never ends. Um, and I think that we carry that kind of humility, hopefully, outside that space as well. What we were talking about earlier, about what may I learn from this? It's a question that is so central 
to us as people, to us as a species, um, what may I learn from this, right? All the way in the front. Um, Janice, thank you, uh, both of you, for this lovely uh, session. It was a bit of a stream of consciousness moment. I read the beautiful title of your session, The Light That Touches Everything, and that's what drew me in. And it felt a bit like walking with Virginia Woolf. You know, she has this wonderful essay where she's thrown out of the library in Cambridge because women were not allowed to enter. And she wrote this whole essay, you know, which takes you along uh, with her as she walks away. And I have to say, I haven't read your book, but I intend to. And I would like to know, um, because you, 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 you like disruption, so I don't want to put a class on it, but I want to ask about your influences, the authors, the spiritual leaders, the right. mystics, uh, the pets that inspired <laughs> you <laughs> to write. And, uh, you know, and have this beautiful session where we're reading your book with you, even if we haven't read the whole yeah book yet. Oh, thank, thank you, you for your question. I think it begins exactly where the printed page lies, which is that I come from a, com a community um, in the northeast of India, a little far from here, um, but I come from a place where um, our literatures were spoken. Um, until the coming of the missionaries, sometime in the mid 1800s, um, we didn't really have a script. Um, so our stories um, were told, were sung, were spoken. And for me, this also forms a central tussle, not just within this book, between fixity and fluidity, but within me as a writer and as a person, because we live in a world where there are um, hierarchies even within this, that the text, the written, is authoritative, right? It's fixed, it, it carries an air of, of, of authenticity um, and weight and value, while the oral, the spoken, is light and frivolous and slippery and a bit tricky and mm, rumors, 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 right? Um, whereas I've spent, I think, so much of my life trying to find bridges between the two because I've been a listener um, within my community um, and beyond, and I'm also a writer. So when you ask me who, you know, has inspired you, I would say the storytellers um, who I grew up with. So I might be a writer, but my earliest, earliest um, literary influences were people who couldn't read or write, who will never write a book. Um, and um, I think that's what I carry with me, the, the urge to listen so that I learn how to tell a story because everyone who speaks tells a story in their own incredibly individual way. Um, so just to listen can make you I think a better writer and hopefully a better human being um, as well. <laughs> I have time for one last question. The gentleman at the back in the red. And we must keep it quick because I'm getting a side eye. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you for giving this chance. So, ma'am, uh, first of all, I just got your book. It sounds amazing. We'll definitely be reading it. And I just wanted to ask, like, in this entire idea of the reductionist world that we are living in, we are creating so many labels, and we obviously want to move away from them. Sometimes I wonder, like, if you move too away from them, wouldn't that lead to a chaotic world again? So, wanted to know your views. An yeah. agent of chaos, Janice. Disruptor <laughs> extraordinary. But that is such a good question. On a more serious note, that's a very, very good question. And... Honestly, it isn't as simple as categories bad, no categories good. I think that would be a terribly, terribly boring sort of approach and a terribly untrue one, right? I think it's much, much more nuanced and much more complicated than that. And that's the reason why this tussle exists in the first place, that there is a desire to understand and 
impose some sort of order on the world so that we may make sense of it, right? Um, I think, and if you read the book, if you go on to read the book, perhaps this will come to you um, in a more, um, you know, articulated um, way. Um, but I think for me, what's really important is the method by which those categories and that kind of order emerge, right? That it is exceedingly human-centric. And that is terrifyingly problematic, right? If we listen, if we allow, if we uh, step down from this top rung that we think we occupy, perhaps there is space for other ways of understanding the world that do not immediately depend on the kind of human-centric imposition that we, um, you know, have so gleefully sort of, um, uh, you know, involved ourselves in for, for centuries, yeah? Everyone, once again, can we have a huge round of applause for the mad, the utterly delightful, and the unputdownable Janice Barriott. Thank you so, so much again, Janice. Janice will be signing books, so please get a copy, please read, and it was such a delight talking to you, Janice.